Hello, hello out there. Everybody hear me? You guys hear me? Hello. Wave your hand if you can hear me. I can see a lot of you guys are um, muted. Great. Just admitting some people here. Hi, guys. Oh, wow, we're good. Great. Let's get everybody in here. All right, I still got to set up the recording. Can you guys hear me? I don't, yes? Give me a wave. Say All right. hello. Hey, you guys hey, can say hello. Hi. We're not, Hi. We're, not to, we're gonna start in about five minutes. I wanna, you know, it's not okay to start early, right? The train leaves off late, it's annoying. It leaves early, it's immoral. That's my saying. How's everybody holding up? This is a pretty crazy time, huh? Yeah. Is it, yeah. Have you guys used this? Um, have you used this medium before? No. Well, first of all, it's a, it's always yesterday. Good time. Yeah, yesterday. Huh? So you're like a veteran now. Yeah, we used it for Levy's class. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm still gonna do the audio because it's for my own use, of course, and everybody else that that isn't hooked in here. But. Um, my goal is to do the class as usual. There is a way in which you guys can raise your hands. In all honesty, um, I'm not 100% uh, sure how you do it, but I think if you go down and look into, um, like mouse over the bottom of your screen, it should give you an option of uh, in either in chatting or waving hands. It get, Mike, it gives you an option in the, it's called more, and you press on more, and then uh -huh. it says right hand. Excellent, thank you, Israel. You guys hear that? I think they, they I heard they're... it, but I don't see it. Anyway. Well, I mean, you can also, there's a chat option there, which is another great way of, um, of getting, uh, you know, getting your, your question in there. I just wanna make sure that, that uh, you guys don't lose the sense that we're still in the classroom together and be able to ask your questions. Um, even though, as you guys know, I'm not always so empathetic to questions, but. But um, I still, yeah, Deborah, you want to actually? Uh, I just want, I wanted to just explain to Peter how he can see it. If, oh, you, tap, if you tap onto the, I'm, I'm watching you on my phone, but if you tap onto the bottom of the screen and all of a sudden all of these options will pop up. Mute, right. stop video, share contact, participants, and then there's more. And if you go to, there are three dots, you click on to more, and then it has, I, I raised my hand, this lower hand, disconnect, okay? And I would recommend that everybody sit on mute unless you want to say something. Yeah, because the chatter, even with the slightest you know, I, gets pretty bad. My program is in German, and I don't have a more or mail or anything like that, but oh, then react, I, out of my I have reactions. A thumb up and uh, hand clapping. So you can always clap. You're always welcome. Yeah, to clap. yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me test this out. How are we doing? Check, check in, check in. Look at that. It's beautiful. So, all right, we got a couple of minutes. Oh, we're going to let everybody else in here. We're still, um, wow, we got a full class today. What's what happens? Everybody's off work. Anybody else going a little crazy? There's, there's five children in my house right now. If you hear anything in the background, I will deny it. <laughs> but, you know, listen, you got to do what you got to do. Get a couple minutes. What else? We have my notes here. Mike, is this interactive? It, it is interactive. Um, and uh, what we're going to ask everyone to do is... Um, Keep it on mute unless you have a question. There are two ways in which you can ask a question. I mean, there are three. You could just jump in, but that might be a little bit confusing. You can write a chat, if I, and the question will show up. You can write it to everyone, or you can just write it to me. I encourage you to write it to everyone so that everyone sees the question. Um, or, uh, Deborah, you want to explain, you did so concisely, how to use the, um, how to use the uh, raising hand function again? Or did she just disappear? She just disappeared. So if you go, if you, 
if you run your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you will, you will see that um, there's a button that says more. You see it there, Joanne? Am I see invite participants, share screen, chat. I see chat. Um, and I'm seeing more. You see more? No. <laughs> All right, well, um, All right. then go with the chat. And if you have a question, yes. you'll, send me a, you'll, you'll send me a question via the chat, and I will be able to see it there. OK, awesome. OK, uh, just, um, just so everyone can see it, I'll type a message to everyone on chat so you just see the box pop up. You have to excuse my spelling. You guys know it's about as bad as it gets. Uh, here we are. That way, by the way, it means that you can write those questions in as we're going along. Um, and I'll try to keep an eye out. I won't always, you know, in the flow, but sometimes in class, I know questions get lost. And that way, it'll actually be really nice. In, in, in order to, um, you know, at least have a record of them and I can try to come back to them. Okay, it's 11.15. So I think we're gonna get started, you guys ready? Yep. Yeah. Enough of this stalling. And as always, I wanna thank the Pardis Institute, that's P-A-R-D-S dot org dot I-L for helping to make this class happen. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome to my home. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is probably the largest number of people I've ever had in, in the bedroom here, you know, and I'm kind of excited for this, this brave new world. But we just didn't do the best we can with- Mike, that's a happened. little TMI. No, I, I, you know what, as I said it, it was you, of all people that I thought of, Yisrael, because you're the one that once made the joke in my class about the fact that everybody knows I'm sleeping with the dean's assistant, which you should know is my wife. But not everyone in the class knew that at the time, so it was a very awkward moment, I'm sure you recall. Anyway. Meanwhile, back to our regularly scheduled programming. This is what I want to do today. Um, we are kind of at the end of a three-part series Mike, on Dude. Mike, oh. I just want to interrupt for a minute. Please tell uh, the class, everybody should have it on mute unless they need to speak to you. But there's at the bottom an option that you just click on mute and then mute it. And when you want to talk, unmute. Yeah, and you can actually actually um, chat in class. You can send messages directly to one another without, uh, without me even knowing. So, you know. Okay, so we are ready. So like I said, we're the third class on Chassidut and I um, plan on finishing it off today and I wanna finish it off in such a way that it sets us up to at least encounter the enlightenment and modernity. Um, and the driving question at hand is still that we left things off and I'm going to revisit because I felt like the end of last class was a, a little bit rushed and there's a lot of richness that I want to draw out. But we left off with this ban of the Graal. The fact that the leader of Litvish Jewry actually issued a public declaration of the excommunication against the entire Hasidic movement. And he was joined in many ways by a huge portion of the leadership of European, Eastern European Jewry at least. The question is how on earth does Chassidut survive and actually even thrive on into this very day? If you recall, that's the sort of question at hand. In a simple sense, it's modernity that saved it. But in order to understand that answer, there's a lot of work we're gonna have to do together to get it done. So that's where we're headed. But before we do, um, there's two things. First of all, one invitation. Um, I have yet another webinar coming up. It's gonna be on, it's a pre pesef webinar. We're gonna talk about chametz and idolatry, um, freedom, and slavery, and it's gonna come up on the next two Sunday nights. That's next Sunday of the 22nd um, at 8.30 at night and the 29th at 8.30 at night. I wanna be clear, because there was a misunderstanding last time. This is a private effort. It's something I do charge for. However, this time, because of the level of demand, there's gonna be sort of a front row seat and there's gonna be a mezzanine. So uh, if people are interested in joining, you can be in touch with me on you know, my email um, or you can uh, let me know after class. So that's just one point of information. The other one is I actually wanted to start with a little bit of Hasidic Torah, which I think is relevant to where we're at today. Because we spoke about the fact that one of the defining characteristics of the, the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov is this notion of Malokal Aretz Kvoto. Yes, that the whole world is actually filled with God's presence. 
And one of the things that will differentiate Hasidut from the Nagdim, from the uh, this non-Hasidic, if you will, um, religious world, and it's something which is with us today, which is, well, how do you react to that? How do you react to the fact that God is everywhere? I mean, Yisrael made the joke before, but how do I react to the fact that God's here in my bedroom, or that, that God is watching me when I'm with my kids, or that God is there when I'm out running in the wadi below my house, which I'm not able to do yet, but I can walk. Um, you know, what does that fill me with? It's meant to fill me with yira. Anybody want to give a definition for what yira is? What's yira? I, I just told you all to mute yourselves, so I, I guess that's not a fair question, right? Um, get somebody, go for it. Oh. Oh. So great. So we usually translate yira as awe, as opposed to usually fear. The word for fear in Hebrew is pachai. Right, and, and one of the critical questions, actually I find in religious life in general, but one of the critical differentiations between Hasidut and its opponents, which will soften as Hasidut takes its place as part of the um, sort of mainstream of religious Jewry. But one of the critical differences is between awe and fear. Remember, we live in a world today where the ultra-Orthodox world is known as the Haredi world, right? Ha- le- the lechrod is to tremble in fear before something. It's a biblical reference, comes from Yeshayahu, right? So therefore, it's not a small question what it means between awe and fear. And the really is the difference between awe and fear is very simple. And since you're all watching, at least I assume so, if you're not watching, you should watch because it's a visual difference. That awe looks like this and fear looks like this that awe and fear are both ways in which we react to a world that's larger than we can comprehend. And a sense of awe is an awesome horizon that opens up. Yeah, there's fear in awe, there's no question. You can't really distinguish the two entirely, but, but it's, it's a fear which is uplifting, which opens out a sense of greatness. Just think of standing at the edge of a cliff. I used to be a rock climber in my younger days. If you've ever stood at the very, very edge of a very high cliff, it's an awesome feeling. Sure, it's scary, for sure, but, but there's something which is an opening of a world, a horizon, if you will, that, that you might not otherwise see, which is, um, which, is hard to, which is hard to compare. Basically, it's hard to compare. And the opposite, fear, is a shrinking in the face of that, right? I get exposed to something which is larger than I, and I crunch up into a ball, and and so you can see how going into modernity, right, when the world begins to open up, and we've characterized early modernity, if you recall, as the two critical intellectual characteristics of early modernity have been, right, an uncoupling of knowledge from tradition, which means that everything that anchored the way you knew the world has been let go, which is <laughs> scary and pretty awesome, right, but also a lifting of the horizons of thought. The sense that the world suddenly got physically bigger with the age of exploration, it got intellectually bigger with the scientific revolution, and with the cross-cultural and the printing press and everything else, like we are suddenly in this massive new world. And the question is, does that fill you with awe or fear? And the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov by saying that there is nothing empty of God is meant to have it fill us with awe and not fear. And awe, of course, can ultimately lead you to joy right? As opposed to fear, which will never bring actual joy. So that's just a a thought, both obviously connected to our time, since when I wrote there to test the chat that, welcome, folks, if you could just, everybody mute their, if everybody could mute uh, their microphone, that would be really great. What's your name? It's for some reason. Right, but but someone is speaking right now, and if actually you could mute your mic, it would be really great. Please. Does everyone look into the lower left-hand corner, and there's a microphone symbol, and if you click on it, if it doesn't have a red line across it, please click on it to mute. Mike, I came back, it's showing, I came back in, it, when it mute, when the other speaker is speaking, the name is Les, just in case. Yeah. That okay. person. So, so, Les, I can see you're not muted, so Les, Charlotte, also is not muted, there you go. Uh, actually, um, oh, look, I can mute people, look at that. Who knew? Um, I'll do that later. Um, watch this. Mute all. Um, 
Look at that. Now I'm, I'm growing in technology as well. But you guys hear me? But aside from the fact that I think that this is an important introduction into one of the particularly critical elements of Hasidut, that the Balshemto, I mean, and honestly, unbeknownst to him, through his emphasis on Malokal Arts Kodo, that the whole world is filled with the glory of God. And his sense that late Ata Panui Mine, that there is nothing absent of God, paved the way for a courageous entry into modernity. It's awesome. It's scary, but it's awesome. Right? Aside from that fact, right, there is a very deep relevance to the world in which we live today. Things are changing more rapidly than probably any of us could have imagined. And they may go back to what they were, who knows? But our choice is to see them as awesome and, and, and see this horizon opening up in front of us, and it's scary, but it's big, or to shrink in fear. By the way, last on this, and then I'll get into the flow here, but the, you, know, you know who mastered this notion? It was the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, all of a shalom, unless you think that I think he's still alive. Um, his emphasis on making sure that Torah went into every new type of media, onto radio, onto television, into the internet, and that whole Chabad stance of that, well, if there's a part of the world that opens up, we have to go there, right, is, is one of the greatest embodiments of this Torah of the Baal Shem Tov that you will ever find. It comes with complications, et cetera, and the politics, I know that. But just I want you to see it for what it is in its roots, right, that, that when the world is filled with God, then anything new that opens up is potentially awesome. And that the obligation of a chassid is to make sure that God isn't just there in potentia, but is actually there in actuality. And that's going to lead us back to our story. So good. That was by way of introduction. Um, and what I want to do right now is just review the few reasons for the ban of the Grah, and then get into the flow of the story of what happened once the sort of single most authoritative rabbinic mind of Eastern Europe declared an entire section of Jewry out of bounds. You guys ready? You can wave like this if you want. Um, okay. So, so first of all, don't forget that Sabbatean heresy. Right, and I don't think we're going to get to the story of, of Emden Ibshit's controversy. I feel like we've moved beyond it in time. But like I told you, it is still tearing Europe apart in, in both political ways and in deep fear cultural ways. And also, it's not unwarranted. We see it in our world today. I mean, I'm, on my door, I have a sign that one of my children put up that says the gematria of, of Corona is the same as, um, I think, Yavo Mashiach. I forget what the, or uh, Ba Mashiach or whatever it is. Right? The Messiah is coming, which actually, by the way, that math works out. But um, so I actually had a little dispute, which was unfortunate because you got to let kids be who they are. But, but I had a little dispute saying, what? this, this is the response. Remember Gershom Shalom's great wisdom that messianic hope is a critical ingredient for survival. But as life gets worse, and for you know, Eastern Europeans, we've spoken about why Eastern European Jewry life is getting harder and harder as the 18th century turns over into the 19th. As life gets harder and that hope turns to a need, there's a sense that it must be that the only possible solution is Mashiach. It gains potentially explosive momentum and leads to divergent energy because who wouldn't be willing to push the edge if they knew that what they were going to do was going to bring the Messiah? Which is all well and good if it does. But what happens when you push the boundaries and the Messiah doesn't come? Shop that speed in its extreme. Or Christianity, which really, as we saw, lays at the root of that with that vision, the Baal Shem Tov, the Shabtai Tzvi, and Jesus of Nazareth, and your poll from last class. So that's one thing. There is that fear, not just of Sabbatean heresy, but of a general hesitancy around mess uh, Messianism. And don't forget about that, because that hesitancy around Messianism is going to follow us right into Zionism. So if we get to Zionism in this semester, if not, the Omer program is going to be about Zionism. I want you to remember that one of the major reasons that the religious world almost universally opposed Zionism in its inception is that it was labeled as a messianic movement. Plus it was anti-religious, et cetera, but that messianism is like the kiss of death. Today in the political system in Israel, there's nothing worse you can be called than Mishichisti. I don't know if you guys know that. But to be called messianist in today's political system is like the kiss of death, which is sad, but I get where it comes from. Okay, that's number one, the, the Sabbatean movement. Number two, there's that general resistance of traditional societies to change. I mean, Hasidut is new. It may, change, it may claim to be the sort of uh, the inheritance of the prophets, but as far as people are concerned, they're doing things new way. They're praying in new ways. They're slaughtering animals in a different way. They're forming their own synagogues. There's a different model of leadership. And all that newness is frightening. And it's also just challenging to the current institutional orthodoxy or hierarchy, if you will. 
And that's also important caring for because a reactionary stance against everything new is going to define religious Jewry as we enter into modernity. And we'll speak at the end how that becomes what you know as orthodoxy. You know, orthodoxy, of course, claims, as did the Hasidut, to be authentic Judaism, right? You can all nod, right? Um, it claims to be authentic Judaism. And, and okay, I'm not going to get into that polemic right now, but I would point out that orthodoxy is as much a product of modernity as the reform movement in the fact that it is a reaction to all the currents of modernity. And we'll speak about it at the end. What defines it is a reactionary stance, not this, or opposed to that. Hasidut will take a slightly different angle, interestingly enough is that the Hasidic world is going to attempt, attempt in many ways to just preserve the organic consciousness of the Middle Ages. Its emphasis on Kabbalah, its emphasis on storytelling, its emphasis on a um, sort of a, a, a corporate existence centered around the Rebbe instead of the citizen's existence that even Orthodoxy will fit into. Right? Orthodoxy becomes a religion very easily. I can be an Orthodox Frenchman, an Orthodox German, an Orthodox American. We're getting ahead of ourselves in time, but you understand what I mean? Orthodoxy can be what I do, right? Hasidut is always who I am, right? And so not only does it preserve that through its emphasis on stories and mysticism, an almost medieval mindset, and its communal structures centered around the Rebbe, a more communal structure, but it's, it's um, got a very powerful capacity to just simply sidestep modernity as opposed to as opposed to opposing it right i just don't live there i mean you may have had this experience you go down into mea sharim and people are walking around in fur hats and silk stockings and, say, and it's completely normal they're on cell phones and but, but it's completely normal you're like wait nobody else looks like this like oh no this is who we are and in many ways it becomes emblematic of their ability to survive it's just we just live in our own world it's one of the reasons that, that Hasidic communities actually do far better in their integration in the modern world than, say, my own community, the national religious world, where all our kids are torn. Am I modern or am I religious? Am I modern or am I religious, right? They're not really sure who they are. And therefore, that's why there's, there's a lot of sort of split personality. That's a discussion for another time. I do a lot of counseling on that front with people with their kids. So that we have the Sabbatean heresy. We have this sort of general resistance of traditional societies to change and the very different stance that Hasidut has to modernity than orthodoxy, we'll come back to that. There's that threat that the knowledge elite always feel from the newcomers, and we'll come back to this, that the Gra saw himself as a real Hasid, and who are these people to be calling themselves Hasidim? Um, remember on this note, that one of the great powers that Hasidut brings to the world is a shift in scale in the Torah of the Rizal. The Rizal, 16th century mystic master, right, brought this notion of tikkun, of a fixing of the world, that every individual has the potential to fix the cosmos, right? Uh, and that led to many things, not the least of which was Sabbatean heresy. The Baal Shem Tov shifted the scale from tikkun of the cosmos to tikkun of midot, the fixing, fixing of one's own character and one's own selfhood, which has a tremendous appeal, but it also kind of downgrades mysticism. It popularizes it. Right? And that will be a big challenge to the knowledge elite for whom mysticism had always been sort of like the metaphysical elite, as it were, of the Jewish world. So, okay, Sabbatinism, the, the uh, sort of resistance to change, knowledge elite, um, there's that threat that the communal leadership feels from the competition for the tzaddikim in the Hasidic courts, right? along with that socioeconomic side we touched on with slaughter. Let's not forget, this is not just a matter of I'm the rabbi, I get all the honor, right? The, the shechita controversy that we spoke about last class really embodies the fact that as soon as you create any sort of new communal organization, there's always money in politics involved. And that the, the slaughter industry was one of the major sources of income for local European communities, Jewish communities, throughout you know, the, the Polish regions. And so to have new Hasidic slaughterers who were answerable to the Rebbe's was not just a political and communal threat, but it was an economic one. Now that problem is going to fade, as we spoke about with, toward the end of last class, that as the sort of state-sanctioned official structures of communal leadership, the greatest of which was the Council of Forelands, are dismantled with the rise of the modern state, what we're going to see is that the Hasidic model of a court 
which is able to wield just as much communal power, but also be able to just pretend to, oh, we're not, we're not a communal organization, we're just the Rebbe and the students, and therefore somewhat fly below the radar and not come into direct conflict with the organs of state power will prove a very important element of preserving communal structures in the sort of advent of full modernity. It's a very interesting story in and of itself that perhaps we'll get to when we come to Napoleon. All right, last piece we actually haven't spoken to about right now, and it's going to bring us into the flow of the story, as it were, um, is the core theological questions. And, you know, there's a big debate amongst the academics. I mean, how much was theology really at play? Everything I told you up to now was sociology, right? Economics, communal power, resistance to change of traditional societies. Okay, the messianism a little bit, but that's sociology. How much difference did the theological questions really make? My answer to that is I can't tell you, but we need to know what they are because they actually speak to where Hasidu really was in many ways something new. Now remember, that core teaching of the Baal Shem Tov was that the, the, he says here in, in Tzvat Rivash in, in uh, the sort of last will and testament of the Baal Shem Tov, he says, this is an important rule. Everything in the universe contains holy sparks. Nothing is devoid of these sparks, even wood and stone. There are sparks from the breaking of vessels, even in a man's deeds, even in a sin he commits. Now, that last line should send up a radar. Even in the sin he commit, there are sparks. Who, what radar? What, you know, so like, what's that pinging for you? Shabtai Tzvi, right? Because he was the one who spoke about God as the Matir Isurim, the one who permits the forbidden, that last stage of descent into the forbidden, which was meant to pave the way for the coming of the Messiah. You can see why it wasn't an entirely unjust accusation that Hasidu was just reformed Sabbatinism, at least in that sense. But um, basically for us, we're going to call this a radical imminence. That God is not only in the Torah, not only in the mitzvot we do, but God is literally, literally everywhere. And then the only question becomes, how do you access God in everything which you encounter. Notice, that's the potential awesomeness and joy that you could be as much with God as you walk through the woods and contemplate the leaves as you could be in the Beit Midrash. That demands a certain consciousness, but it is nonetheless potentially possible, right? But the Baal Shem Tov, in the end of the day, went further even than Spinoza. Because that also sounds like Spinoza. God is nature. We spoke about this a little bit last week, right? Because he taught that there's actually no real distance between humanity and God. It's not just that God fills the whole world, is that there's no really difference between you and God, that any experience of distance is just an illusion, which God created for the purpose of teaching us how to overcome it. He tells a story. It's a classic story you've probably heard before about a king who surrounds himself with walls and gates that were only an illusion, but promises a great reward to anyone who would reach him despite all obstacles. Some reached the first gate and gave up. Some fought their way further in and deeper, but never quite made it. It was only the king's son who with great effort made it all the way to the king. And when he got there, you know what he realized? That there had never been any barrier separating them to begin with. So in the mashal, obviously, the king is God, right? The chassid is the son. And the consciousness we're after were, is actually when we say that the world is filled with his glory, we're speaking about ourselves as well. He says every thought, emotion, everything comes from God. By means of this knowledge, there's no longer any barrier separated between man and God. And with this, all the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. It's a fantastic way to try to live. I'll give you guys a plug for um, the uh, summer executive learning seminar that's happening at Pardes. I'm going to give a class on Rav Cook in the tension between what it is to have a sense of self and a sense that God is all-encompassing, because Rav Cook does amazing things with these teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. But Rav Cook wasn't around to help the Grah figure that out. The Grah was deeply alarmed by this teaching. He saw them as not just Sabbatism, but we were sliding all the way into idolatry. I am God is what he heard in this. And what lay behind their argument, this key theological distinction between Hasidu and their opponents, which we're going to add to our sociological licks, is really a question of whether the Arizal meant it when he spoke about the Tzimtzum. 
right? The, the, the Arizal teaches that in the beginning, what God does is withdraw and create nothingness. Because, of course, separation, a space between us, is the necessary precursor to all relationship. If you don't have separation, you can't have relationship. We've spoken about it many times, I'm sure. I don't have a relationship with my foot, which is actually quite doing quite well right now, thank you. Um, because it's just part of me. I have a relationship with others because they are not. I mean, think as a parent, if you don't appreciate the fact that your children are their own people, you won't have a very good relationship. Ditto within your spouses. And I'm sure we've all had relationships where we've sort of lost our sense of self into another person. And it may be ecstatic in the moment, but it's not a recipe for a long-term healthy relationship. There has to be some separation, which is then bridged, right? Because if it's only separation, it's not a relationship. So, but the question is, and the question that lay between the Baal Shem Tov and the Gra, between the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim, is when the Arizal said that God withdrew and left nothing, and into that nothing, he projected a ray of light that became creation, did he mean it? Was it literally empty of God, or was it just a mashal, a metaphor? Now, why does that matter? Because according to the Gra, according to the whole Litvish Kabbalistic system, which to this day has Major Rav Moshe Shapira here in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, is the inheritor of the, of the, of the Litvish Hasid, uh, sorry, not Litvish Hasid, Litvish Kabbalah. The whole way of knowing the world, very deep, I studied with his son-in-law at Chappelle's for some time, like, it, it's very intense. If you've ever learned the book Nefesh Chaim, wave your hand if you've ever seen Nefesh Chaim. We might speak about Rav Chaim Veloshin today, and we'll see if we'll get there or not. But that is the sort of, um, I don't want to say Bible, because no Litvak would say that. It's the, it's the primary text um, of, of Litvish Kabbalah. And, and it is founded on this notion that there's an absolute gap between God and creation. And that gap is bridged by one thing, God's will, embodied best, of course, in the Torah. So therefore, if you're seeking God, you seek God in the Torah. It's true that the, the, the Torah has mitzvot, and so therefore, it's not just within the book itself, and you go out and you do, and, and, and that when you slaughter a cow and you use its skin to make tefillin and you're finding pieces of creation, that's fine, but those only through the mitzvot. The idea that the Baal Shem Tov is arguing is actually the opposite, which is that it was an illusion. There's nothing empty of God. That when, when God withdrew, it was an illusion so that you could have a sense of selfhood in order to develop a relationship. But in the end of the day, says the Baal Shem Tov, late ata panui mine. There is nothing empty of God. And therefore, God can be found everywhere. It's true, Torah and mitzvot are an act of divine grace that were given to Am Yisrael. But you can meet the Creator wherever you seek Him. The whole world is filled with His glory. And to the Grom, this was pantheism at best and idolatry at worst. So now we can see where the problem lay, let's see how things play out. Before I go there, questions or comments uh, before we get back into the flow of the story. Uh, I'll ask people to maybe either raise their hand or you can write the questions um, here to the side. Is anybody else losing audio or video? Because I see one person commented that, but I haven't heard from anybody else. Questions, I'll, I'll give a little bit extra time in case people are... Uh, I'll try to speak a little slower. Sorry, I'm kind of excited by this stuff. I got one question there. Anything? Going once? Going twice? Okay. Don't be afraid to stop me. I can see, I am seeing your chats. That's very helpful. I will do my best to be a little slower and clearer. Um, I wonder if my papers are actually covering my mic as well. Okay. So back into the story, you recall that the Baal Shem Tov died in 1760 on Shavuot, according to tradition and that he left the Magid Mimizricht of Dov Bear in charge, and that Rav Dov Bear only lived 12 years after him. Rav Dov Bear was the one who gathered students around his table, and he was the one that decentralized. He raised up these, all the famous students, like, like the Baltania, Rav Schnur Zalman Miliadi, and like uh, uh, Rav Leibman Bidechev, and, and the Chernobyler. Most of the big Hasidic names that people know sat at the Magid's table, and as soon as they became capable, he sent them out to form their own Hasidic communities. But the Magid dies in 1772, and he doesn't name a successor. He'd been decentralizing, right? But what else happens in 1772 was that first ban of the Gra, the first declaration by a major 
personality, rabbinic personality of Eastern Europe, that Hasidut was beyond the pale. And the fact that it came in the same year that the Magi died was a crisis for Hasidut because there was no single leader who was standing in the breach. So who stepped up? Well, it was Rav Shnur Zalman Miliadi, the, the youngest and perhaps most powerful of the students of the Magi Mimizrech. Right, you may know him as the Alta Rebbe, right? The, the, the sort of founder, even though he didn't found the movement, but he's considered the founder of Chabad Hasidut, right? Schnurzalm was born in 1745, small town in Yozna, and that's the, in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It's before it's split up. He's further north, closer to modern-day Lithuania. He claimed descent from the Maral of Prague, who we call the great sort of mystic and philosophical mind. Um, and like I said, he's the youngest, but perhaps the most powerful student of the Magid. And he's known as perhaps the most powerful because Rav Shnuzam and Miliadi combined both sides of the Torah in a way in which I would say very few human beings ever have. Perhaps the Gra being one of them, which is the side of mysticism and the sort of what's called the Pnimiyut, the innerness of Torah, as well as a complete master of the halachic system. If people have ever learned halacha, the Shulchan Aruch HaRav, right, he had his own sort of systematic approach to halacha, is an incredible work of halacha. Um, and he was, he's an important book that's learned by sort of standard smicha students even today. Um, but his chief work was known as the Tanya. Wave your hand if you've ever learned some of the Tanya. Right? Um, that's, that's interesting, not so many people. All right, you guys are late box, it's okay. Everybody's gotta be something. Um, the, the, but the, the level at which I'm sure you've heard of the Tanya and its exposure should tell you something that was unique about Rav Shnur Zalman. And, and the thing about Chabad Chasidu that makes it so powerful, aside from the personalities that it's produced, is the fact that it's a systematic approach to Hasidic thought. Most of the tzaddikim, the students of the Magim Mezrich, and then their intellectual and physical descendants, wrote commentaries on the weekly Parsha. Um, some of them wrote sort of other works, but None of them compare to the systematic presentation of Hasidic thought, which you will find within the Tanya and the other works of Chabad Hasidut. So therefore, it makes a lot of sense that it would be Rav Shnur Zalman who went to the Gra to try to head off what he saw to be a disaster for all of Am Yisrael and to reunite Polish Jewry. Because he could understand both sides of the Gra's mind. Not only that, but because he was located right on the edge of Lithuania. His Hasidim were spread throughout what would soon be the Russian Empire and, and Lithuania. So they were like little islands in the midst of the Miknagdim. They were having the hardest time once this ban was promulgated, right? It, so therefore, it was both intellectually and spiritually he felt the need to bridge the gap. It was also the Makam She'en Ish, his master hadn't left anyone behind and he was going to stand up. But it was also personal in the need to protect his Hasidim. So, the story goes like this, a very interesting story. Um, and I'm happy to share the, the link with you. I was looking around for research I found. It was really great. A Chabad rabbi who was actually at a, for Breng, right? Uh, Chabad does a, a celebration um, on the 19th of Kislev when you get into the what's, why's, and wherefore. Maybe we'll tell the story of the, of the Alter Rebbe in more detail some other time. But it's a, like a, it, it's a party with Torah and, and L'chaims and, and Rav, Rav uh, Yosef Bear Salvation was invited, right? It's like the meeting of worlds, the Rav, the Rav, right? He's the inheritor of Brisker Torah. And of course, who's the, the progenitor of Brisker Torah? Anybody know? Come on, somebody can just say it. It's the Grah. whose story we're not gonna get to, I can just see by looking at the time. We'll get to it sometime, but not today. Rav Chaim Muzolajan was arguably the chief student of the Vilna Gaon. And he began the whole yeshiva process which produced what's known as Brisker Torah. So here you have the, the scion of Brisker Torah, which has its roots in the Gra, sitting at a Fabreng with the previous Labavitcher Rebbe. It's a beautiful picture, right? And they're talking about the story of when the, when the Alter Rebbe went to meet the Gra in order to try to head off this ban and reunite Am Yisrael. There's many, many versions of this story told, but I love it to tell the one by, by, the, by the Rav told to the Hasidim. So he says that Rav Shulam Zalman went 
And the tradition amongst the brisker he went with Rev Levi Midbirdeshev, right? The sort of uh, Senegormi Israel, he's a great defender of Israel. The two of them went to the town of Vilna. They went to the town of Vilna, and do you think they act, asked for the Gra? No, they didn't ask for the Gra because no one called them the Gra then. That was something they called them afterwards. Gra is right, uh, right? Gaon Rev Eliyahu, right? But um, he was called the Chassid, which can give you some insight perhaps in his opposition to the Hasidic movement. He was a Hasid. He knew everything there was to know about the hidden and the revealed. He had the personal characteristics beyond measure. So they, they went to the Kloys of the Hasid in Yiddish, right? The, the sort of house or the shtibel, the synagogue of the Hasid, right? Um, and they asked in the shul, where's, where's the Hasid? So they point them up the stairs. They go up the stairs, they knock on the door. And this is how, how Rav Salvatic told the story. He said, they knock on the door. Rav Shnur Zalman, the Alta Rebbe, and Rev. Levi, I can never say his name, Rev. Lady, Lady, me, Berdachev. And they say that the Gra peeked through the hole in the door and he saw the face of Rav Shnur Zalman, the beauty, the holiness, the Yuat Shemayim. And he knew that if he opened the door to let them in, after two hours of speaking to them, he would end up walking out hand in hand and spreading Hasidut together with them. And he didn't want to let that happen. So he jumped out the window in order to flee, and they never managed to reach him. Now, that story says volumes. And notice the story told by Rav Soloveitchik, not just by the Hasidim. In the end of the day, one might think that would have caused the, Ra, the, the Gra to soften his opinions about Hasidut, but it was not the case, because in the end of his life, in 1797, the year that he dies, there were many of his students who felt that the Gra had softened toward Hasidut. So he wrote actually the following in a letter. In describing the followers of the Baal Shem Tov as, quote, a generation that has raised its eyes and spoken words against the Most High. This is the Lord your God, Israel, and every tree and every stone. And they pervert the verse, blessing the glory of the Lord from his place. Baruch, right, quote, Hashem uh, Komo. And, and you give life to all of them. Alas, the evil shepherds who invented a new judgment and a new teaching, which their students that came after them imbibed, and thus the name of God is desecrated by them. It's a pretty intense condemnation. Which brings us back after all this discussion to our question, which is how on earth with all of this, all these differences and the, and the personality of the Gras so fiercely opposed to them, how did the Hasidim actually manage to not only survive, but thrive, right? And not just thrive, but become part of mainstream Jewry within the space of, let's say, 20, 20, 50 years? 50 years from this, this statement of the graph? So you guys ready for that? Before we get to that, comments or questions on what we've done so far? Is it coming through more clearly, Shmuel? You can just, right? When was what? Someone asked me, when was what? So someone said, when was that? I don't know when what was that the... The statement of the Gra. Oh, 1797. Other questions, comments, things people want clarified? Okay. Well, we're going to keep rolling then. So what I want to do now is um, lay out a little bit of this encounter with modernity. And we're saying modernity as a blanket term, but we need to really split modernity kind of um, on two fronts. And this is gonna carry us now, from now until the end of the semester, and will be a big part of what we're gonna do during the Omer. What we do the next semester, I guess, will depend on you know, where the world is at at the time or something like that, right? Which is always a funny statement until it's not. Um, so modernity needs to be understood on two fronts, enlightenment and emancipation. And, and the two will go together in many ways, but they're not the same thing. So in, in particular, I wanna start off actually from the Jewish perspective, a bit of a theoretical perspective. We're talking about tradition versus traditionalism. And then what I wanna do is introduce some of the key elements of like what is enlightenment. And then we'll talk about the political developments in terms of the rise of absolute, uh, enlightened absolutism and the vision of the Polish kingdom. That's where we're going now. You guys ready? Give me the two hands if you're ready. All right, I got, I got one couple people there. Okay, great. So, guys, do you wanna play the game? Um, so, okay, so the difference between 
tradition and traditionalism is actually critical for understanding what orthodoxy is today, right? We all know that there's a principle in physics that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that's not just a foundation of physics, it's actually a, applies to sociology as well, right? Um, because the notion that is coming forward in the Enlightenment, and even the notion, by the way, that Hasidut was putting forward, is that there's a need to regenerate the Amnesty. Right? That, 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 that somehow we've deteriorated. And we'll see when we talk about Enlightenment philosophy, how the different philosophers identified the problem and what they saw as a solution. But it, essentially the idea is that we need to fix the Jews. We need to fix the Jews, right? Um, and of course, someone who's traditional, who locates the basis of authority, not just in law, but in way of being in the past, doesn't feel they need to be fixed, right? This is one of the great controversies that comes with Darwin, if you're familiar with it, right? Darwin says that we're descended from monkeys. Our sages say that our ancestors were angels, right? That, those are two very different ways of looking at the world. Right, so, so I'm not gonna get into that polemic right now. I mean, you guys know that my first degree is in geology, um, but it's critical, the posture that it generates because a traditional society, when under attack from those who try to reform it, almost inevitably shifts, either joins the other side, as we'll see with the Jewish enlightenment, or something else happens to it. And that something else is probably best defined by the great sociologist, Max Weber. But Max Weber says that a traditional society is one whose acceptance of authority, right, or tradition, right? Sorry, let me say it better. They, I'll read it here instead of trying to paraphrase. He says, a traditional society is one whose acceptance of tradition as a source of authority is unquestioned. Meaning, we do this because it's what we do, and it would never occur to me to do otherwise. Think about a traditional society. If you, you may have more traditional friends or, or, or uh, you know, sort of like a, maybe in the family. And, and once you start asking critical questions, well, why do you do that? It's deeply unsatisfying to the modern mind, certainly to the postmodern mind, to get the answer because that's what I do, right? But that is the definition of tradition. We do what we do because it's what we do and it would never occur to me to do otherwise. And the power of that is it's unreflective and it's therefore much more flexible. Ironically enough. Yeah, I see some questions in the face. Why is it much more flexible? Well, because if you look at the Gemara, and you don't get more traditional than the Gemara, right? Right? It, some of the changes which occur in the Gemara in the practice of Judaism are incredibly radical. I have a teacher who loves to say in class, don't ask cautions on the Gemara from Judaism. Right? Meaning like, like, don't, you know, like, don't bring problems from what you actually do today to the discussion of the sages, the sages, the sages. Right? And, and, and that level of radical thought, which was embodied in practice, but maintained a sense of continuity of identity is one of the hallmarks of traditional life. Because we do what we do, because it's always what we've done. And the fact is the human mind has no greater capacity than to believe that whatever it's doing now is what it's always done. And as long as no one's standing from the outside with a historical record of what you used to do and what you do now and offering you three different options of what you might do and claiming that they're all equally legitimate, then actually you're much more capable of adapting without losing a sense of continuity of identity. This understand, it's very important to understand this. Somebody doesn't understand that, please stop me now. The, because that Maureen you're waving, you don't get it? I'll say it again, that the, the power of an organic process is that it feels that wherever it ends up, it's still attached to where it began. I've given you guys that joke before, that you know birds evolved from reptiles, but there was no point at which a parakeet woke up in the morning and said, oh, yesterday I was a brontosaurus, right? Like, I'm so lost, right? Because there's a gradual process where each step seamlessly flows into the other, even though evolutionary theory doesn't so fit that's seamless. But nonetheless, there's a continuity of identity which comes from the ability to say, whatever I'm doing now is what I've always done. But as soon as a traditionalist society emerged, and maybe it'll help if I give you the contrast, right? Then we have a different phenomenon because a traditionalist society sticks to tradition as a source of authority in a self-conscious -act, act of commitment. I could be modern, but I'm not going to be. I choose this as my, once you make a conscious 
choice, it becomes an ideology as opposed to an organic way of living. And that ideology is fundamentally different than an organic way of living. Because ideology, of course, as you know, as we see today in orthodoxy, doesn't lend itself to change. Not only does it not lend itself to change because we have to explain it in the ideological structure, how could it be that we chose to be traditional, but now something has changed and we're going to, doesn't that make us modern and progressive? And wasn't that what we chose not to be? Right, as opposed to simply going with the flow of living life, right? And this is why the birth cry of what we know as orthodoxy, which happens in the very early 19th century, not long after the Grah dies, right, um, is given by the Khatam Sofer. Khatam Sofer, whose story we'll tell sort of like when we get further into modernity, but is the leading mind of Hungarian Jewry in his day. Um, and he, well, probably the best quote that I can give you is from one of his chuvot, right? He says, it's necessary to be one who preserves the Torah. Notice, preserves the Torah. Up until now, we've been living the Torah. We've been defending the Torah. Preserve the Torah. Okay. Our sages warned against those who provide an opening and seek leniencies for the radicals of our people who desire them. If these radicals find a minute crack, they'll greatly expand it into a breach. Therefore, it's best to elevate and exaggerate the nature of a prohibition. That may sound familiar. Better to elevate and exaggerate the nature of a prohibition than to show any leniency. Because as soon as you show leniency to people who are looking for leniency, they're going to widen it out into permissibility or permissiveness. Right? The Khatam Sofer was the one who, according to tradition, coined the term Hadash Asur Mina Torah that anything new is forbidden, right? And that is the embodiment of the reactionary stance, which is a shift from a traditional to a traditionalist society. That's the challenge which Am Yisrael is about to face in its encounter with modernity. Yeah, Marsha. So did I... Did the Khatam Sofer see the Hasidic movement as falling into that category that you're talking about now? Great. That's exactly, thank you for that segue. Because that's really the question we're at. Because the Gras saw the Hasidim that way, right? Oh, they're, they're changing stuff. They're, they're, they're not praying in the same way we pray. They're doing shkita different. My answer to you, I'll give you in the words of the Alter Rebbe. And we're moving forward a little bit in European history here because we've gone all the way to the edge of the 19th century and we, we're going to have to go back in Eastern Europe. And we're going to have to go back into Western Europe to really understand. But what's happening at the turn of the 19th century in Eastern Europe and all of Europe? Napoleon. Right? And we'll tell his story in relationship between Napoleon and the Jews. But if you're not familiar, Napoleon basically conquers most of Europe and at least the first wave of conquest. And, you know, it was the Russians where he failed, not the last to break down there. And who was the great leader of Russian Hasidim at that time? The Alter Rebbe, Rav Shnur Zalman. And when Napoleon, in the very beginning of the 19th, sorry, yeah, very beginning of the 19th century, before even the Khatam Sofer said this, when Napoleon was advancing, and the question was, and now remember, he was emancipating Jews. As we'll speak about, the French Revolution led to emancipation. So one might think, Go Napoleon, go and many Jews were quite enthusiastic about Napoleon. The Alter Rebbe said the following. He wrote it into a letter to a friend of his, Moshe Meisel's. Um, he said, quote, should Napoleon be victorious, wealth amongst the Jews will be abundant, but the hearts of Israel will be separated and distant from their father in heaven. With our master Alexander, meaning the Tsar of Russia, will triumph, though poverty will be abundant, the heart of Israel will be bound and joined, sorry, lost my page, bound and joined with their father in heaven, and for God's sake, burn this letter. <laughs> right? That's what he says at the end. Um, so you hear that? The Alta Rebbe agreed with the Khatam so far. Oh, life would be materially good with emancipation, but spiritually disastrous. And so therefore, he was praying 
on behalf of the Tsar, who he knew would oppress Am Yisrael. Notice, he, like, there were poverty. He knew the Tsar wasn't going to be good to the Jews, and the fact that the Tsar was not going to be good to the Jews was, in his opinion, a good thing. Which is a very strange, very strange stance, but one can see in it already the seeds of the enforced poverty that much of uh, sort of ultra-Orthodoxy lives in today, which is that in this many ways true that modern society has offered kind of an exchange, material comfort for spiritual vacuity. It's very difficult to live in our society of consumer abundance and to maintain an intensity of focus on the divine. It's just hard. It's not, I'm not saying it's impossible. God forbid, I would never say it's impossible, but, but there is a deep challenge there. And so therefore, this is really in many ways, you know, in your question was spot on, Marsha, that in many ways, this is the real bridge across which Hasidut transitions from being an oppositional movement to being part of mainstream religiosity, which is in the recognition that the real enemy is the freedom that modernity offers. And that the response to that freedom was to take a reactionary stance. And the Khatam Sofer said, Chadash Asur Mina Torah, which is a play on words. If people are familiar, in Halakha, Chadash is, a, is the grains which are cut before the Omer is offered on the day after Pesach, and you're not allowed to eat those grains. It's a whole kashrut issue, etc. But he's playing on a thing that anything new is forbidden from the Torah. So what the Alter Rebbe said was just the sociological sort of reality, or sorry, the political, that's the sociological, the political reality. Political reality is we don't want emancipation because as soon as you let people out of the ghetto, they're going to chuck their tefillin in the river and run off to Odessa to go to medical school. Tom Sofer said, as soon as you let them, I don't know, walk down the streets of Prague with an umbrella, which is a famous argument, right? Um, next thing you know, they're not going to keep Shabbat. Right? The great umbrella controversy of the Nota Behuda. If anybody ever had to learn Hilchot Shabbat, it's, here's the homework. If you guys have a copy of Shmir Shabbos Kehilchata in your house, the great Shabbat halachic work by Rav Neubert, if you have it, look up umbrellas when you go home. And just read the tone of what it is he has to say about an umbrella, or whether you're allowed to use an umbrella on Shabbat. The tone, not the content, the tone of it. And you will understand exactly what I'm saying. Why is it that everything else reading, it's a great book, I highly recommend it, but it's like reading, it's like watching paint dry. It's not exactly a thrilling read. Until you get to that section and suddenly you feel the fire. That for generations there has been an injunction against using umbrella. Like, what? It's because that umbrella is exactly what the Khatam Sofer is saying. So we don't use umbrellas. All these newfangled folks who are enlightened, they're starting to use umbrellas. They're walking up and down the river. Which river runs through Prague? Or, come on, help me out here, but somebody must know. Danube, thank you. Um, right, walking up and down the banks of the Danube you know, and their promenade. And technically they're not violating Shabbat, but, but they could, the, the rabbis could see where they were going. So this, this shift between a traditional to a traditionalist stance, to an unreflective, organic sort of um, extension, which is a bit of a, of, obviously it's a bit of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, overgeneralization. Obviously there have been other times in history where we've been forced to encounter ourselves and think about what we're doing in face of the Greeks and in face of the, you know, the, you know, the Muslims, etc. I'm like, I don't want to overplay this traditional thing, but everything pales in comparison to modernity because of emancipation. Because we were actually potentially going to be allowed out to play with the other kids. The Muslims were happy to have us in our corporate world and we had to look at them and think about ourselves. The Christians were happy to have our, us in our corporate world. We looked at them and thought about ourselves. But suddenly modernity is going to say, you can come out and play now which is a fundamentally different challenge. All right, you guys with me? It's 12.07 and I wanna talk, um, talk about some enlightenment. But questions, comments? Oh, it's the, Mold oh no, it's not the Danube, it's the Moldova, you looked it up. All right, sorry, I can blame, I can blame Peter. Um, questions, comments? I wanna make sure you guys feel like you are in the flow and you're, you're, you're with me. Did, by the way, I forgot who asked me to slow down. Is, is, are you following? Is the sound coming through better? Just if you text me and say yes or no, then I can, I can shift accordingly. Um, Hi, Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Rosemary. Hi. Why is it that for the Hasidim, 
all of this new stuff is a threat if God is in everything? Great question. It's a great question. And, and, it's a power it's, thing? Well, listen, it, it, first of all, I just want to honor the question because let's make sure we're clear on the problem. Right? So I presented the Chassidut in a very idealistic sense in the beginning. That the whole world is filled with God's glory and that's why Chabad is not afraid to go everywhere and, um, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Right. What you're pointing out is like, well, then modernity should have been like the biggest joy ever because it opened up all these new horizons where you could seek God. And I think that that's true, but I think also that once Hasidut was let out of being an oppositional movement within traditional society and actually had to own that sort of wide open stance in opposition to larger non-Jewish modern society, that the challenge was too great and that for survival's sake, they joined the reactionary camp. Mm -hmm. And it's a real challenge, but that's why, by the way, today, if you guys are familiar, there's a whole phenomenon which has been labeled neo Hasidut. Right, yeah. and, and, and it's trying to, here I mean, in, in, in America, much of it is actually sort of non-halachic. It's, it's rooted in the, um, uh, no, blanking, um, Reb Zalman. Right? Oh. Um, Reb Zalman, uh, Shlomi Shachter's, right, um, right, right, right. The, the renewal movement. It also right. it associates itself a lot with Reb Shlomo Karlbach's teachings, but, um, but it's, it's more of a, a, trying to reach those romantic roots and the sort of radical amazement of Heschel, et cetera, bring all those pieces to try to be that chassid in modernity. Here in Israel, it's a little bit easier because we live in a Jewish saturated world and it's much frummer, although it's also pushes the boundaries a lot. Um, it's more involved in certain elements of the um, national religious world of Cook story. There's something called Habakkuk. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it in the Israeli society. If you're Habakkuk, it's, it's Chabad, um, Breslov, and Rav Cook. Wow. <laughs> which are all very radical sides of Torah, which most importantly, none of them have an established tradition of interpretation. I missed that. It was none of, none of them have an established tradition of interpretation, meaning there are lots of radical things in the Bible. There are some crazy radical things in the Midrash and the Gemara, but we have thousands of years, literally, of interpretive tradition, which have sort of mainstreamed them and, and in many ways made them more viable and all, but also safer and then often pulled the teeth of the radical nature. Whereas you read Rav Cook, I teach Rav Cook at Pardes, I'm gonna do it in a few hours. Um, the, sometimes you read what he's writing, you're like, oh, 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 how, could he, how could he say that? And there's very little interpretive tradition out there to, to put him back in the box. And that's why it's compelling. It's also why some would say it's dangerous. So my answer to you is I think that the sociology trumped theology in that case. That's the simple. Okay. Okay. Other questions Thanks. or comments before yeah, you're welcome. Before we talk about what is enlightenment. You guys ready to be enlightened? Sorry. I just can't resist the jokes. I can see my own face. So like telling jokes is like I can do it all day. Um, okay. So the enlightenment, if you like look at the academic standpoint, like what was the the Enlightenment within Europe, forget the Jews. It basically starts as a trend in 18th century Western culture. I mean, you could trace its roots earlier toward human reason as the touchstone of all knowledge and belief, right? And as a standard of measure for values, right? Which we know this because when you make human reason the touchstone of knowledge and belief, that's uncoupling knowledge from tradition, right? Yep, we're, we're about what we know in the world. And, but as a standard of measure for values will be very important for our discussion because it means that the idea of a traditional value having an intrinsic value, we do what we do because it's what we do and it defines who we are, is nonsense. That's actually, there's a great word that the enlighteners will use, especially within Am Yisrael. It's obscurantist. You guys ever heard that? If you've ever read the translations of like the Jewish Enlightenment comments on the Hasidim, they're always being called obscurantists, which is like just a word. It means they obscure things. Like you're not interested in the light of reason. You're like, oh, we do this because of the mystical. And so I'm like, no, that's superstition. You're just, you're just hiding behind. And of course, the later discourse is you're hiding behind the desire to maintain power through ignorance. 
right? That's the accusation, ultimately, that will be leveled. That, that, that clericalism, that the Hasidic Rebbe's or the, the rabbis of the yeshiva world, in, of orthodoxy, are attempting to maintain their own power because the Enlightenment is not fond of the traditional structures of power. So the Enlightenment, again, it's a, it's a general trend in society toward reason as the touchstone of knowledge and belief and as a critical measure for values. And um, if you're gonna sort of like give it a positive statement, you might call the whole project of the Enlightenment salvation through knowledge. That knowledge can make people happier, more aware of the world, more moral, and more free. Now, today, after Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Auschwitz, you know, Stalin, Mao, I mean, you know, add the list, we're not so certain that knowledge will make you happier, more, more moral, or more free. But that was the deep belief in the Enlightenment. And that's one of the things that's important to remember about the Enlightenment is that though within Europe, the Enlightenment did involve stripping away a lot of the formal structures of Christianity, one of the things it kept was a secular messianism called progress, right? The Jews were the ones who introduced prog linear progress in time into Western thought. This idea that the world was created something out of nothing is a beginning. And the fact that it's going to some redemptive moment is an end. Christianity adopted that. They had to come up with the whole second coming thing because their first round didn't work, right? Um, but nevertheless, you understand that's, an, that's it's progress. You start here and you're getting toward what you want. Once you get rid of the classic messianic sort of the theological justification for that, you strip it away, you're still left with progress. How do you measure progress? Well, we measure it as the closer we get to the Messiah. But the enlightened world will measure it as the increase in happiness, awareness of the world, morality, and freedom. And that's why, if you've ever read the German philosophers who wrote around the rise of Adolf Hitler, Eric Fromm is perhaps the best example, but there are others, the whole, um, what's known as the Frankfurt School, right? They were all struggling to understand how did this happen in the heart of enlightened Europe? Like how did, how did this progress turn into regress in such a dramatic fashion, right? But we're not there yet. So the enlightenment really believes it's gonna happen. Um, the first major figures of enlightenment really come from England, but the culture of it takes off in France. And just to give you like, a, one statement that we're going to bring with us from England, from uh, where the Scottish, you know, enlightenment, as people know it, uh, um, or it's really the tail end also of the scientific revolution, is, is Sir Isaac Newton. We've quoted him before, but in his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, which was published at the end of the 17th century, 1687, he says, I have not as yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravity from phenomena, and I feign no hypothesis. This is the key, is that he's observing the world. He doesn't understand the reason, but he doesn't pretend to know and project his knowledge onto the world. This is the early scientific world. This is what's called the inductive reasoning. But the key here is it's a famous phrase, I feign no hypothesis, which is that, that reason will show you the reality. Tradition and the belief that you already know means that you live in superstition and darkness. So that concept is gonna get carried forward into French culture and ultimately, it's in Germany, will find its most powerful expression. Immanuel Kant, great philosopher of the Enlightenment, actually has an essay which is entitled, What is Enlightenment? Or it's actually answering the question, what is Enlightenment? And he says the following. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed knowledge. Knowledge means like nothingness. Says knowledge is the inability to use one's own understanding without another guidance. Right? This knowledge is self imposed if its cause lies not in the lack of understanding, but in indecision and lack of courage to use one's own mind without another's guidance. Dare to know. Have the courage to use your own understanding is therefore. Therefore, the motto of the Enlightenment. And that's key, because that's a huge shift 
in about 100 years. It begins with, I feign no hypothesis, I'm trying to observe the world. But now it's dare to know. And if you don't dare to know, you know what you are? You're a slave. You live in knowledge. You live under the guidance of others. And who are those others? Well, who provides guidance for the world as it's, as it's entering into the uh, 18th century? In, in the world, you know, Western Europe, where this is taking place. There's two institutions that we're going to have to fight. Name them for me. Right, the church, good. Church, yeah. And the monarchy, monarchy and nobility, right. right? Inherited power, wedded to theology. Now, from the Christian standpoint, we're all looking from the outside saying, yeah, the church has been bad news for 1,700 years. We knew that, say the Jews. And the kings, whew, they're even worse. But, you know, that sword cuts two ways because we also have our own structures of power which are going to be judged to be holding the people in knowledge. But that's what really defines the Enlightenment as it gets off the ground, sort of like as we're heading into the 18th century. The roots in France are actually critical to understand for its impact on the Jews. Um, so it really, there's a group of thinkers in France um, in the early 18th century, they're called the philosophs in the broad sense. And I'm, and I'm giving you sort of like some like basics of European history just to understand its impact on um, Israel, if you want more information, you can either look it up or you can stop me and I'll try to speak out more if you have specific questions. But I'm not pretending to give you the entire history of the European Enlightenment because I think in the next 25 minutes that might be overwhelming. Um, but the philosophers functionally are public intellectuals. The public intellectuals who want to, again, in that enlightened sense, apply reason to the study of every area of learning, right? Philosophy, history, science, politics, you name it. And not just to study, but they also had a very critical eye toward the, society, the structures of society, right? Meaning they began to de denounce Christianity as the ultimate source that keep people sort of mired in superstition and enthralled to the clergy. And they began to speak against the abusive governments of Europe, which was enslaving their bodies. Let's face it, the, you know, Louis XIV famously says, I am the state. Right? Meaning everybody else exists, exists for me. That's the ultimate slavery. So, so these philosophers were not only interested in reason as an intellectual tool, but they were interested in reason as a, as a social critical tool. And that's why enlightenment is going to be wedded very quickly to emancipation. Right? Um, if just to give you like a point of fact that many of you may know, if you're familiar with Diderot's encyclopedia, the encyclopedia was perhaps the sort of best known product of that culture of the philosophers. Um, and, you know, today in the age of Wikipedia, we may not appreciate the impact of making such a vast amount of broad knowledge available to so many people. But in the eyes of the philosophers, this was the keystone to liberation. You must know. And if I can print it in a book and put it in other people's hands, then they'll know too. And if more people know, then we can collectively emancipate ourselves from these structures which enslave our bodies and minds. That's the sort of basic equation without getting too far. And they were also, of course, as reference to our previous conversation, they were deists. Remembering that deism is that sort of um, belief that God did indeed create the world, but has basically made it the way it's meant to be and, and has backed off the watchmaker God who puts it all together, winds it up and steps away. Um, and we spoke about whether deism was really a viable philosophy, whether it didn't just mean it was kind of a pale Christianity or whether it wasn't just a, a sort of a, a, a facade behind which atheists hid and the, the accusation of atheism is going to rise and will get a very strong voice by the time, you know, the sort of late 18th century gets rolling. But for now, they, they were still believed in a divine creator. Most of them were still culturally, if not even religiously Christians, but they had begun to release themselves from the bounds of traditional religion. So there are two personalities that I think it's important to um, understand in order to appreciate the impact of the Enlightenment on the Jews. So, first of all, that was an introduction, very brief, but I hope to the point introduction to Enlightenment. Questions, clarifications, comments? I'm also watching the chat. Remember, guys, if you don't want to unmute and say something, you can always write the question there. Okay. You can write it as it goes along too. If it comes up, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to it. 
So there are two personalities that come out of this uh, sort of French Enlightenment culture, which are important to understand because of their impact on the Jews. The first one is the Baron de Montesquieu, um, who, who publishes his Spirit of Laws in 1748. Now remember, 1748, the Baal Shem Tov back there in Eastern Europe is just getting rolling. He's moved to Mezhbaz. He's starting to teach the Hasidim, but there's no Hasidic movement yet. This is where it's important to remember that Eastern Europe and Western Europe are having very different experiences. The name of the book is The Spirit of Laws. It's uh, Baron de Montesquieu, which I'm sure I'm saying wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll write uh, Montesquieu here so that everyone can see it. This. Sorry, my typing is, oh no. I, I might've just spelled that wrong. How many times I dropped my notes? I'm sure I spelled that wrong, but um, Baron de Montesquieu. And so it's just important to keep that sort of split screen consciousness there that Eastern Europe right now in many ways is still in the Middle Ages. And Western Europe is starting to take sort of rapid strides toward what we know as modernity. So why does the spirit of laws matter? First of all, like I said, it elaborates on a lot of the thought of the earlier English Enlightenment thinkers, particularly John Locke, if you're familiar with the, with the Contractarians. Oh, what just happened? Sorry. Um, with the Contractarians. Um, the, it's maybe best known in the general public for the emphasis that Montesquieu lays on the idea of separation of powers and advocating for the idea of checks and balances in government, which, of course, is the foundation of the uh, American constitutional system. Montesquieu is the first one to really sort of like articulate that as a critical element of democracy. Remembering that in 1748, democracy was an idea. It was not a reality anywhere in the world at that point. Ooh, and it might've started off in South America. But if it was, it was the very beginnings. Um, but for our discussion, what's more important is the fact that he also lays a heavy emphasis on the idea that laws and behavior are the product of environment. Like, almost ridiculously so. I mean, he speaks about the nature of climate and its impact on law and how, you know, I mean, this is also the age in which intellectuals were getting information of like, what did people look like in Central Africa? What did people look like in far Asia? And they all had all kinds of theories of how to like understand, like, are we all human? Or are we not? So Montesquieu believed that all people in essence were the same. All people came from some sort of primordial sameness, but the environment is what causes us to be different physiologically and sociologically in our laws and our customs. Now, why does that matter for us? Because uh, Montesquieu was also a very early advocate of Jewish emancipation. And he, because he um, argued that despite our religion, because he was still Christian, so he wasn't gonna accept religion, despite our religion, that Jews should be granted civil rights. Why? Because it, it was emancipation itself that would make the Jew a better person. And Montesquieu looked at all the Jew hatred and the characterization of the Jew as hunchback, hook nose, money grubbing, sort of like cheating, devious, all these classic mix of medieval um, Jew hatred. Remember the religious and the economic mix, which hasn't gone away, right? Um, the, but he looked at that and he said, well, yeah, because that's what we've made them into. See, if laws are a product of the environment, and even one's physiology is a product of the environment, then what happens to a people that you basically place in cultural serfdom for 1,500 years? It says, oh, they become a Jew. That's what happens. Therefore, if you emancipate them and you give them full civil rights, within a, he believed that within a few generations, the emancipated Jews with full civil rights would be practicing an enlightened, purified form of Judaism, basically the deism to which he adhered. Right? He says, actually, in the spirit of laws, it happens that slavery debases, burdens, and destroys the mind, whereas liberty forms it, elevates it, and fortifies it. We make for ourselves the mind we want, and we are the true artisans of it. This is critical because it's one path of, of relationship to the Jews in modernity that some subset of European culture and Jews themselves will take, which is that the Jews are not an absolute alien other. We are a warped product of oppression, ripe to be reformed. And emancipation itself will reform the Jews. Now, it's very important 
to see both sides of that coin. And I'm curious how many of you heard that as a enlightened, like, wow, this guy wants to let us in and realizes how bad they've been to us. Is that a hand raising because you have a question, Marsha, or that's how you heard it? The, how that, so one could hear that as a, a very sort of generous, generosity of soul. Like, oh, I get it, what we've done to you. Yeah? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Well, to what end? To what end was this, you know, elevating the Jew? Why did he see right. this as even, necessary? you know, necessary? Yeah. Excellent. Well, first of all, the, the Jewish problem is going to come into being with emancipation and modernity. Let's remember that. Is that in the medieval world, there was no Jewish problem in the sort of socio-political sense. I mean, there might have been a theological Jewish problem that we've had since early Christianity, right? That why do the Jews still exist if God rejected them and chose the Jews? And we saw way back when, when we learned about it, that Augustine offered this answer, which is that the Jews are the suffering remnant kept alive to remind the world what it looks like to reject salvation, but also as proof that the prophecies of Jesus within the Hebrew Bible are actually true. And that and was all embedded in his philosophy of what's called the city of God and the city of man, right? That the world was the city of man. There was an ideal called the city of God. And as soon as the world moved toward the city of God, everything would be great. The Jews would all convert at the end and second coming, etc. That whole world breaks down when Christianity, it begins to break down with multipolar Christianity and the, and the reform, you know, the, the Reformation. But it fully breaks down in modernity when, when people start saying, well, Christianity is a barrier to freedom. It's not, the, not the, the vehicle for it. We need to build a society based on reason. Oh, huh. Well, how does a Jew fit into a society based on reason? They're very unreasonable. They're like more religious than the Christians. Says, says Montesquieu, that's just because we kept them in cages. If you let them out, and you emancipate them and give them full civil rights. Remember, this is all theoretical. Christians didn't have full civil rights in 1748, right? The, the idea of civil rights didn't exist. This is before the French Revolution. He's trying to think about what would happen to humanity. And, and it, when it comes to the Jews, that's like a, it's like a, a test case. So he says, ah, let them out and they'll become just like us. And his goal is that everyone be emancipated. And I think as you're sensing, it's a secular redemptive goal. And the other way to say it is that the price for emancipation in this model is you have to check your culture at the door. You can be emancipated as a human being, but not as a Jew. Because what a Jew is, is a deformed product of oppression in his eyes. He meant it, I think, out of generosity of soul, but his Christianity prevented him from looking into the Torah and seeing sort of like a greatness, which other French philosophers were able to do, by the way. Um, but but he, as his humanity, also, I mean, that was his Christianity. His humanity, however, made him look at the Jews and say, well, all we need to do is set them free and they'll be good people just like us. And the unstated truth is that the us is a deist Christian us. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So, so this path, the path of reformation, and we'll speak about other paths. We only have about 10, 15 minutes left. I want to make sure we come to a, a, a certain wholeness is in many ways opposed sometimes directly by a much more famous voice of the early French Enlightenment, which is François-Marie Arouet. Is that how you say his real name? Better known as Voltaire. Right? Um, you saw me looking at you, Peter? <laughs> um, the, um, the, he's, of course, the great satirist of the Enlightenment. Maybe it's most prolific author when you look at how many books Voltaire and books, essays, plays, etc. Voltaire actually wrote. He was you know, certainly, if not the, was one of the most prolific. And um, I mean, among that enormous collection of writings are literally hundreds of letters and essays concerning the Jews. And, and you know, there is some academic controversy about whether Voltaire hated the Jews or not. I find it hard to hold up the side that he might not have hated us when you really kind of look at the what I see to be overwhelming. It's a topic he returns to again and again and again, so much so that some of his later critics would accuse him of an obsession. And there are complexities and contradictions. Not everything he says about the Jews are negative. Some of them are even laudatory. 
right? Um, but bottom line, it's the overwhelming opposition because unlike Montesquieu, Voltaire held out no hope for the regeneration of the Jews. The idea of regeneration was not the way he related to the Jews um, because like many other sort of enlightenment thinkers, and by the way, their forerunners in the Renaissance, you may recall, Voltaire saw the hope of European culture in returning to the, the Greco-Roman roots, right? Christianity mucked things up in his eyes and the eyes of many of the philosophers. So the, the salvation for European culture was to go back to the Greco-Roman roots of European culture. Well, lo and behold, when you look back at the Greco-Roman roots of culture, there's no love lost between classic Greco-Roman culture and the Jews, right? We all know this, right? So, so what he found there was like, huh, well, the Christians hate the Jews and the Greco-Roman culture didn't like the Jews. And, you know, I don't really like the Jews. So what's something wrong with Jews? And it fit a very different worldview that Voltaire had in the way he dealt with the diversity of humanity to which the philosophers were exposed, as was everybody else in the 18th century, is that he held to uh, something which is known as polygenism. Right? It's a racial theory, and he's one of the earlier um, sort of writers on racial theory, something which is going to become increasingly important in European thought through the 18th and 19th century, and in many ways culminates in Nazi Germany. Sorry, I just got to say it the way it is. But racial theory is going to become, as an aside, racial theory is actually important for the Europeans in figuring out how to deal with the world when they go to the New World, they find like, natives there who don't look like them. They do look like them, they don't. I mean, they have all the same facial features, but, but they're different color and hair. And say, okay, that's interesting. How do you explain the diversity? What's the core reason that racial theory emerges? It's a justification for power. That when early conquistadors, Spanish and Portuguese, went to the uh, New World, to North, what became North and South America, their justification was theological. Right? The conquistadors went with the priests. They were bringing truth to the heathen. And, and that justified, in some of their minds, not, don't misread me, I'm not justifying, but in, sort of the, in their cultural sense, it justified the total dominance that they established to the point of slaughtering whole populations. But once you reject Christianity, that's not justification anymore. So how are you going to justify the fact that the Europeans are going to go way, way further in conquering the whole planet and colonizing it? Well, one of the real answers is racial theory. If, if the European race is just superior, well, then it's just bringing enlightenment to the world in a secular fashion. And we know how that plays out. Um, but so polygenism is the notion that each race has actually separate origins, as opposed to Montesquieu, who believes that all of humanity basically comes from some sort of primordial unity right, that, that um, Voltaire actually explains the diversity of the world that he's exposed to by saying, no, like the, there are actually Asiatic roots and African roots and European roots. And since the Jews come from an Asiatic root, we are foreign to European culture. We're a foreign element. And this is critical because if Montesquieu establishes the path that emancipation can happen for the Jews so long as we basically reform, meaning the gateway to modernity is check your culture at the door, which, I mean, you can say he meant well, I don't know how comfortable you are. I'd like to be a full member of society along with my culture, but you know, what Voltaire establishes is the fact that the Jews are a foreign element which can never be part of modern European culture. So, so Montesquieu's end path is assimilation. What's Voltaire's end path? Annihilation. And we're gonna see, not surprisingly, that as modernity progresses, those two paths are gonna squeeze in on the Jews. And that reactionary stance that was taken by the Hasidim and the Khatam Sofer don't look so crazy when they're hemmed in by assimilation on one side and annihilation on the other. And that will be the pressure sort of cooker out of which Zionism emerges as a third way. Um, so just a little bit more about Voltaire, as long as we have a couple minutes. Um, I, I mean, I have all these quotes here. 
I actually don't want to waste my breath on his quotes about the Jews as a barbarous people or, um, you know, surpassing all nations in impertinent fables. I mean, I, like, the, the, there's no end to it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no end to it. Um, what I'll do is, is take two minutes for questions. In the last five minutes, I'll, um, I'll uh, just maybe round out what we've done. I want to leave, actually, um, the, the political side of this story, emancipation, for, for going forward. So questions or comments, because I think I've we've get, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I think adding another element just not worthwhile. Questions, comments, thoughts, people want to share things, they want clarified. That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, Aviva has a question. Great. Also, how many Jews were there in France? That how many had, Jews were there in France? In France, that would arouse this kind of sort of thinking on both parts. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, and it's one that really um, I was planning to address um, when we get to um, when we get to uh, the sort of the emperor and the Jews, like the rise of the uh, the French revolution but i'm looking right now it's, it's pretty cool that i can actually look at my notes while i'm talking to you because the the there were very few jews in most of france for most french the, the french had been expelled from france in, so the jews have been expelled from france not the french have been expelled from france the jews have been expelled from france in um like the early 14th century and yeah they come back and forth but the largely what the jews in france were um sort of uh had begun as as conversos, and um, and really, I'm just looking here. Hang on, um, one second. Let me see if I can find it. They began as conversos and, and were like highly acculturated at this point, um, highly acculturated Spanish and French speaking Jews. The 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 sort of Jewish problem to the French doesn't happen until much later when the French conquer Alsace Lorraine. From the Germans, I'm not going to actually get it right now because I feel like I'm distracting myself from talking to you. Um, but that will come into our story. And then a big chunk of traditional Ashkenazi Jews who look like Jews, who speak Yiddish, who are engaged in traditional U Jewish um, economic practices of, of, you know, sort of cattle trading and money lending. That will happen not long before the French Revolution. And then, then the French are going to have a Jewish problem. At this point, I wouldn't say in the tens of thousands at the most. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Mike, Maureen, um, I guess two things. Um, Montesquieu and Voltaire are clearly uh, polar opposites. Um, any, obviously, any, any sense of which perspective uh, prevailed? I can understand with, with the, for the church, Voltaire, but, but I guess I wonder about uh, Montesquieu. That's first. And I think the second, I think your, your point about uh, the differences between Eastern Europe and Western Europe are, are really very important and hope that you'll return to that as, as we move forward, because I think that clarifies a lot about many things, including uh, the evolution of Hasidut. Absolutely. So I'll say the second one first is that we will maintain a focus on the difference between the arc of development between Jewry and Western Europe and Eastern Europe. The best way to do that is to track what's called the Berlin Enlightenment, what happens to Western European uh, Judaism, and the Haskalah, the, the, the Jewish enlightenment, which has its roots in Eastern Europe. So we will for sure maintain that. Um, in terms of um, which path Voltaire or Montesquieu, so to speak, um, the, the world goes, the French Revolution, when we speak about it, we'll see that the French Revolution, in many ways, is philosophically forced to give citizenship to the Jews, even though they resist. We'll speak about it. The National Assembly resists until its last day granting citizenship to the Jews. In the end, though, they're forced to basically say, well, if you're going to make a universal declaration of the rights of man, then, like, you have, unless you're going to say the Jews aren't humans, which many people were more than happy to say, but, but unless you're going to say they aren't human, then you kind of have to give them citizenship, which is a, a, a reflection of Montague's perspective and ultimately as we'll see, the idea was to, to, the, to the Jews as individuals, everything, to the Jews as a people, nothing. 
My, right? and, and, and since so much of our culture is bound up with peoplehood, it did involve a necessary deconstruction of Jewish culture. Yeah, another where, question? Where does Rousseau fit into this? So it's a good question. Right now, in the two minutes that we have, and, and the fact that it's not it tips of my fingers, I can't answer, but I will look and I'll, I'll get prepared to answer that, okay? Um, I, I see someone asking, did any specific incident cause Voltaire's antipathy toward the Jews? Um, there, is a, there is a claim that Voltaire was a, was a heavy debtor and that he, he owed the Jews money. I've heard that, see, not just like a claim, it's made by academics as well, and that it was actually a personal antagonism, which found its, I mean, that's why people claim that a lot of his more vehement um, anti what we would call anti-Semitic remarks, as opposed to his culturally judgmental ones, um, were in letters as opposed to in his essays. So there is a whole world out there that says, no, he was not a Jew hater. He just hated a couple of Jews that had their teeth in him. So the, you know, I, that is an argument to be made. There's a great book, which I think I have right down there, if I can quote this, um, The Jews and the French Enlightenment. Um, by a famous academic whose name is invading me right now. It starts with H. Um, he, he really lays out the whole case against Voltaire. I'll look for it if anybody wants. Um, I'll try to remember to bring the title next week. All right, one more minute. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Voltaire's famous quote of, I disagree with what you say, but I shall fight to the death to defend your right to say it. How does that jibe with the way that he feels about the Jews? Well, like I said, that, that whether, you, whether you pin it on his racial theory of polygenism, or you simply say it was a product of the fact that he rooted that sense of freedom in classic Greco-Roman culture, he saw the Jews as an alien element of society. That was extended to those who were possibly participants within society. But the Jews were a problematic element. Now, again, he had only defend, he'd only developed his concept of society within a world of absolutism. He had not yet passed the test of democracy. That would wait till the French Revolution for at least a, a brief showing. So, so it, it's, it's hard to say, but it doesn't seem to me, and that's also part of the debate about whether he really hated the Jews as a category or whether it was antagonistic toward them as individuals. So I'm just gonna have to leave that as a question. Okay, guys, it's, it's 12.45. First of all, I wanna thank everybody for coming and for really uh, sort of like being active participants. I wanna bless us all that the situation should pass and should bring only blessing in its wake. And right. we'll, stand, we'll stand strong and uh, we'll keep learning together. That should not stop. So everybody, be well. Thank you, Mike. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, if Thanks. folks are interested in the webinar, you can be in touch with me. Otherwise, I'm going to end the meeting. And uh, you all have my email. So if you have questions or I can be helpful, let me know. Thank you, Bye, Mike. Bye, everybody. Well. Bye.